Okay, I'll go below him in Shaitan Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum all and thank you all for joining us. Uh, with me, I have Brother Munir Mukaddim. How are you, Brother Munir? Doing well. Alhamdulillah. Just a quick introduction. Uh, Brother Munir specializes in project-based change management and advocates for action research and critical leadership. He is especially invested in research on cultural competency, gamification, and nonviolent communication in school settings. His recent book, It's Useless, the Emirati, explores teacher perceptions of Emirati student attainment in private schools through the cultural competency framework. So we're going to be talking about uh, the deficit-based views of adolescent boys. In particular, you've been researching um, amongst the uh, Emirati community. So we'll hear a bit about that, inshallah. And um, I'm ready when you are. Yeah, let's, let's roll. Okay. Uh, first question, why did you decide to research and write about Emirati boys in the UAE? What was the impetus? Great. Well, first, I just want to welcome everyone. And uh, for me, uh, you know, working in education uh, is a fluke. It's something I never saw myself doing. I was always on the other side of the principal's desk. So uh, uh, that kind of uh, disenchantment that I experienced as a student and uh, disengagement, uh, disenfranchisement, if that's a word, English teachers out there can correct me, uh, continues to fuel kind of what I do currently on the other side of the principal's desk and, uh, and, and, and reminds me of what it means to be a student and a learner. And I think it just... Uh, adds that perspective to my work. I'll just give a, a quick background. I'm currently uh, the principal of a, of a boys' school from grades 6 to 12, so that's middle school and high school. Uh, and uh, to the question of why research Emirati boys, uh, it's at once a very personal uh, issue uh, for me uh, based on the work that I do, working day in and day out with Emirati boys. And it's also a global uh, challenge the gender gap uh, and attainment uh, between males and females or the minority attainment gap between certain minority groups uh, such as you know Emiratis or uh, you know Latinos or uh, white middle class males in England so uh, uh, I experienced some critical incidents if I can share that with you the first one is uh, uh, my first year in this context, after having observed uh, the lesson of a colleague, kind of we, we stepped out into the hallway and uh, he kind of whispered into my ear, he's like, you know, uh, Mr. Munir, it's useless, they're Emirati. And uh, that kind of, uh, I took at face value, long day, difficult class, the, the man's frustrated. Uh, but. In my months to come, it, it was a sentiment that I had picked up on in staff rooms, in hallways, and even at, uh, at conferences, educational conferences, of course, not during main speaker events, but during your lunches and dinners and coffee breakout yeah. sessions. But there's this hit, hidden sentiment. And even personally, I found myself uh, negotiating uh, the degree to which I believe that. Uh, wow. Do I believe it? Do I not believe it? Uh, wondering, you know, on the scale of, of political correctness, am I following to prejudice? Is this racism? Yeah. But also, yeah. we are we are social observers as educators. I mean, we are also yeah. reporting what we see. So, yeah. is there truth behind this phrase? It's used as the Emirati. Uh, if no, what? How do you then uh, explain the problem? Um, so that was, that was a yeah. Well. The questions that had popped up in your mind, I think I resonate with because um, being based in Sydney uh, and having Lebanese background, I'll hear the same thing about the Lebanese community and in particularly the Lebanese boys. And so then I would question, well, is there an issue? Is there an issue with my community? Um, because it's not a one-off comment. It's, it's just this across the board, many schools where it's this common language and common thought um, where if... A Lebanese boy um, is, you know, misbehaving or not engaged. Then um, it's so easy to say it's that community. Whereas you don't hear it often with other communities. And I'm sure, um, you know, in different contexts, you, it's it's a lot of minority groups who do um, cop that um, belief. So you know, 
um, I shared with you earlier that uh, in, in Melbourne, in Australia, it would be the Sudanese community. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, the Latina community in America um, or the white middle class community um, in England. So um, can you tell us about the deficit thinking and teacher perceptions of the Emirati boys in the UAE? Yeah. So uh, the first, uh, my first approach uh, was to problematize the issue. Uh, and so I wanted to investigate what truth uh, lies behind the statement by looking uh, factually at, for example, the attainment uh, results or attainment indicators of Emiratis as unique kind of cohort, uh, which is, I mean, not wrong to do. Always uh, schools are being uh, urged nowadays to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have data-driven decision-making and data-driven teaching. So, and we do as a school, uh, you know, categorize groups in terms of males, females, uh, learning difficulties, uh, at risk, non at risk, gifted, talented. Uh, and we do have categories of Emirati, non Emirati, expat, Arab, uh, you know, just to observe trends. Now, on a, on, a, on a local level, the most local level, my school, but also on a national level, the results consist, consistently show that yes, Emirati students under, under attain. In, exact, in every single subject and across all the grade levels that are being tested. And not only that, as students uh, move through the school system, the gap actually increases between expat yeah. and, and uh, Emirati students. So there is weight to yeah. this perception. Uh, the deficit thinking, I think it would be too easy for us uh, as admin and also us as educators to quickly brush it off as, uh, you know, uh, wrong or not productive, or there's some truth behind it, but how do we, uh, how do we problematize this issue uh, in a way that can remove barriers and bring, bring clarity? So as part of my research, I started looking into terms uh, such as self-fulfilling prophecy. I wanted to see how damaging is this? Uh, and interestingly, from the from the literature, I didn't find that the much research showing that there is a strong correlation between uh, teachers' perspective of their students and the degree to which that affects attainment. The correlation uh, in the literature review and meta analysis is shown to be very very low. So actually, I, I kind of lost fuel at that point, thinking, okay, maybe you know they can be prejudiced, and we can be prejudiced, and we can be racist, and maybe there are moral implications to that and ethical implications. But it's not affecting, uh, you know, a student's attainment. A student's attainment. Okay. Uh, okay. But I linked it to se teacher self-efficacy and the the extent to which teachers believe that what they give is going to yield results. Uh, so that's where I, I stepped into to cultural competency. Okay. Uh, and the extent to which using this term Emirati, like the Emirati learner or the Lebanese boy or Lebanese Australian, uh, to which extent culture is, is seen as a barrier to learning and how culture can then actually be used as a bridge to learning. And that's where I stumbled upon a really interesting uh, plethora of, of uh, ideas related to cultural uh, or ethnic learning styles. Yeah, so being uh, their cultural needs and their yeah. world view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, the, cult, the eight cultural dimensions of learning. And again, uh, quickly I realized that uh, looking at culture required a, a deeper uh, examination of culture beyond the five Fs. In the literature they talk about the five Fs of food, flags, folklore, festivals, famous people. We're, yeah, we're going to talk about that and talk about issues related to for example, perceptions of time, yep. uh, motivation. And if I could just throw out there a quick example of how we use that in our, in our school context yes, to please. remove barriers and to uh, build bridges uh, was the issue of punctuality. For any of our, of, uh, 
our Arab brothers out there and, and my family also has Arabness in it. So I, I, I give myself the authority to, to stereotype. <laughs> but the issue of punctuality, you know, they, they say here you have Arab time and Western time. And Arab time yeah. basically is not related to clock time. It's related to an event like after Maghrib. After Maghrib technically can, between, can be between 6 p.m. and 3 in the morning. But we'll meet after Maghrib. And then, uh, so I'm sure our audience gets, gets the gist of that. So the issue of, of students coming to school, <laughs> the issue of students coming to school at 7.40 mm. uh, was very difficult. You're not just dealing with, the, with, the, with students, but you're dealing with parents and it's a whole cultural mindset. Now for years, and this issue actually uh, started emerging in our inspection reports by the ministry. So it was very embarrassing for us as a school who's trying to go towards student-centered learning and all these flash words of blue sex on and cooperative learning and integration of technology for us to be held back by, you know, the school has a problem in morning punctuality, not just in one report, but in two consecutive reports. Wow. So, and, and these reports are published online and, uh, you know, we're given a, a grade according to it. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, so we went down the punitive route and the judgmental route of saying, you know, what's wrong with our students? They're not respecting time. First warning, second warning, calling parents in, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that route didn't work. Now, when, when I came across the issue of cultural competency and the, the cultural dimensions of learning and perceptions of time being one of that, we started saying, okay, not everyone sees uh, linear time as the way we do, but our yeah. goal is how, how do we uh, create a situation where it's meaningful for our students to be at this place at this time. So our the way we frame the problem is very different. Instead of saying they're Emirati, they don't care about punctuality, it's an Arab thing, there's no hope, uh, punish them one, punish them twice, punish them thrice, it became okay. <laughs> it became how does it become meaningful for them to be here at, at a certain time. Yeah. And what happens at 740, not only are we registering if they're late or not, but we then we sing the national anthem. And the national anthem and the, and the theme of loyalty to, 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 the, to the country and to the, to the rulers in this country is very much emphasized. It's very much in, integral to the Emirati identity. Oh, wow. So that night, we drafted a text message and the next day, students who came after 7.40, instead of saying to uh, parents, dear parent, your son was late to school today, or your son did not respect the time, or your son was not responsible in managing his time, we said your son did not attend, or your son was absent from the national anthem. Oh, okay, yes. Yep. Overnight, we saw a 180 degree turnaround in attendance. I mean, the Quranic <laughs> If you see them entering, uh, you know, the dean in, in, in waves and waves. I remember standing there in the corridor the next day, and not the next day, I don't want to exaggerate, but it took two or three days, but <laughs> entering waves without even me saying, you need to go up to the morning assembly hall, which in and of itself was a, was a, was a challenge, you know, to, to herd all these kids up. But that issue just resonated so deeply with what was meaningful to our students and it's just such a, 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 a good example of how powerful these cultural keys can be. Uh, and, and having that, uh, that reflexivity to, to reflect on first my own cultural biases, you know, how I perceive time, how my students perceive time, and, and creating a, a bi-directional relationship of that, where it becomes meaningful for the both of us. Mashallah, it's such a beautiful example. Um, thank you for sharing. What about in the classroom in terms of engagement? Because um, we had a poll up this week, the gritty question, um, which you had your say in regards to how we should word the question. And majority of um, voters had voted that there is a lack of engagement. Um, and your example with um, showing uh, coming to school on time and how you've managed to um, basically influence uh, the students to coming to school on time through culturally responsive um, means. How have you done so in the classroom? You know, uh, I was at a recent conference and a, a teacher 
in training asked me the same question and I disappointed her with my answer by saying, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but you are the one to find the answer. What I can yeah. provide is questions that can hopefully guide you to that answer. Because mm -hmm. the example I gave is so culturally specific. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that it resonated so loudly uh, and the change was so deep, it can only be because it, it, it matched the context I work within. Yes. So when yeah. it comes to the classroom and you know, you're talking about different age levels, you're talking about, I mean, and even the word culture itself is ridden with, with problems. It facilitates conversation, but what I found quickly in my research is that the, the term does not hold uh, critical examination. Uh, so the deeper you get into the issue of Emirati and you know, it will, the, the, the stereotype will crack until the point you get to something called human pedagogy, where you're coming down to the very human that's in that chair at this point of time and in this place. And that is the ultimate, uh, you know, that is the ultimate prize. Uh, yeah. But yeah. it's not about the Lebanese boys, but it's about yeah. Ahmed at this age with these interests, with these yeah. challenges, with this background, with this, you know. And, and that's where I would urge, uh, you know, viewers and myself to, to look at uh, something I synthesized in my book uh, as the cultural competency framework. So I did kind of a, a synthesis of all the literature out there on cultural competency and, and put it together in, in one framework. So there are five or six areas where both teachers and uh, educational leaders can kind of reflect upon and see how their, their practice is being guided by these different, different areas. So I, I don't have an answer, uh, but... Uh, I think you did give us a bit of an answer. Um, you know, reflecting back on the fact that our students are humans. And I think sometimes we can get a bit carried away and forget that, um, you know, during uh, staff room breaks um, and you hear the um, the language and the conversations, that the deficit-based language, uh, it's as if we forget that they are humans and what we're doing is backbiting. Um, and, you know, you kind of desensitise yourself from that. So to me, I think you have given us an answer um, and that would be to um, tap deep into each student, understand who they are, their interests, um, build that rapport with them, that strong rapport, build that trust with yeah. them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, for, for the fa fairness of all our, you know, teachers out there who are holding it down in the classroom, something that did yeah. emerge in my research, quite ironically, is the extent to which, uh, so the cultural cultural competence framework. Uh, is divided into two areas, cultural competency in the classroom level, cultural competency on the school level. And my research found that we need to adapt the model to also include macro level factors. So it's happening in the classroom, on the school level, but also in the, in the macro context, you know, kind of when you talk about district level and just the country as a whole or the region as a whole. Uh, because, uh, and this goes back again to teacher self-efficacy, uh, Quite strongly, teachers uh, felt that issues uh, related to either the school or even macro uh, level factors have a bigger impact on student engagement than their own teaching practices. You know, and, and, uh, so for example, uh, I'm facing students not engaged because of what's happening at the home. Okay, yes, yep. So a student, a teacher, no matter what strategies and what mindset and what attitude and what patience and, you know, <laughs> feel that there's something happening outside of the classroom environment, outside the school environment that is being more detriment, uh, uh, more significantly influencing his disengagement than what I can offer him. Uh, that's an example of, of, of the family, what's happening at home but also yeah. in, in countries that where education is, is increasingly centralized or you know, coming top down where either ministries of education are having a say or you have kind of this, these inspections, right? Uh, yeah. These expectations to meet kind of cookie cutter standards across the board. Yeah. Yes. Often those uh, reports and those expectations that are driving school agendas 
I mean, yep. if you look at you know school development uh, plans, how many of those targets and goals are things that have organically been picked up upon by teaching staff and you know, but and how much of it is being just kind of a reaction to an outsider's inspection report, right? Or or right. some decree or some policy that was uh, you know implemented all of a sudden last year and we need to make these standards you know so it seems like uh, the students and teachers are not at the center of the decision making process yeah. and a lot of them are coming from outside and that's where to give teachers benefit of the doubt uh, you know and that's what's interesting about the, the the title of this talk is is systematically is there something there and that's where I would give it to, to teachers and encourage administrators and even policymakers to consider about how a system, systemically on a structural level uh, decisions are affecting things in the classroom. You're right, mashallah. Um, very much, very much to think about. Um, well, then tell us a bit about your students that you work with. Uh, what's their perspectives on learning, aspirations, and expectations of their teachers? <laughs> Uh, my students. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I would say, uh, so generalities include choice. I've noticed students like to feel empowered by choice, that they get to choose what they're, what they're studying, and if not what they're studying, what areas of their study to focus on, and if not that, at least how to present their knowledge, uh, whether it's a worksheet or a presentation or a video, uh, yeah. choice and also pursuit of, of individual interests and this is again where the modern school system and we are struggling to to leave behind the factory model and go mm -hmm. towards something that allows for basically chaos I mean if, if we were I mean education is at a crossroad and there's not one educational conference I don't attend that doesn't show you the the, the classroom from a hundred years and a classroom from now picture and makes yeah. the argument that we haven't done enough to change. And, and basically, you know, one of the scenarios that's being talked about is in 20, 30 years is that brick campuses will disappear, uh, learning will be individualized, personalized, uh, that teachers will no longer be, or they're already no longer, uh, you know, centers of, of information, but merely facilitators and coaches. Uh, so, if I want to be honest with myself, with my students, I think there's, we cannot do enough to meet their needs. Technology has definitely uh, given me hope. I was never a technology person, but now this, this is my office. I mean, I don't have a physical office anymore. I'm just with this guy in classrooms and hallways and, and technology definitely kind of breaks down the walls and allows for personal interests and uh, you know, differentiation on that sort. But there's, there is something systematically about our, our schooling, which, which also explains why this could be also a global, a global problem. And we have, to, yeah. we have to remember as a species that modern education as we know it is only 200 years old. The idea of a group of 16-year-olds or 14-year-olds being stuck in four That's walls right. for seven right. hours a day. That is not uh, historically how humans learned with each other uh, and uh, you know how skills and knowledge were, were passed down. There was very much an, an apprenticeship model where you know people were out there in the workforce. And it's so ironic that all these sure. conferences and, and these initiatives, it seems like we're trying to uh, just break away and go to something that's very natural. You know, I, I, I saw three recommendations at a recent conference where it's like uh, spend less time in classrooms, uh, interact interact more with strangers. And what do you think about it? It's everything that the school is providing. The school provides these walls. The school provides uh, just interaction with the teacher itself and, and basically no one else. It's, it almost seems, uh, you know, unnatural for, for boys You're to be right. learning. And I think that's yeah, and I think that's why there's been such a huge um, homeschooling trend lately. I'm not sure how it is in the UAE, but in Australia, it's just um, growing significantly because of these yeah. um, issues that we can recognize. We mm -hmm. can see how unnatural it is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah. Definitely. So uh, but I, I guess it's a good thing that we are acknowledging that as well. That's a good sign. I do, I do want to give, uh, Yanni, just to bring some hope uh, to the conversation, uh, there is the NIASC accreditation body. I don't know if, if they have a presence in Australia, but the New England Association for Schools and Colleges, they're an international accrediting body. They accredit Ivy League universities such as Harvard, and they have hundreds of, of schools and universities under their belt. They, they've recently uh, uh, picked up rapport in the UAE, where now the Ministry of Education requires schools who want to be rated you know, very good or outstanding, they need to be accredited, accredited by this external body. So they are kind of people who are, you know, they are the watchdogs. They are, uh, they put these standards in, 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 in place uh, to kind of reinforce the status quo. But ironically, they've just come out with a new framework, and I urge anyone to go YouTube it right now. It's called the ACE framework, A-C-E. Uh, and they're rolling it out now in different countries. It's a radical, radical approach to education. Okay. And in a nutshell, the, the director of NIASC, uh, in a workshop where he was training schools on this new ACE framework, said, what if your student in grade seven is interested in raising chickens? How are you meeting his needs? And of course, this is like someone pulling the rug from under you. I mean, what are you talking about? You know, we have <laughs> hours a day, we have subject teachers, we have a curriculum to teach. We have assessments. What do you mean raising chickens? And he said, this is what this framework is going to, this is the, trans, the extent to which schools will be transformed once yes. they go through this framework. Uh, where, I mean, it's about taking down walls, about uh, integrating subjects. It's about really allowing for a space where students yeah. can pursue individual needs. He talked to the degree of having a chicken coop. And he said, what prevents you from doing that? We said, well, there's a class that will take down the wall. But what about, you know, you're in the middle of a lesson. Well, there shouldn't be any bells anyway. It should be free movement. <laughs> if it was coming out of some, you know, hippie out of California, you'd say, okay, but this is the very man who is, uh, you know, who is representing the, the institution that internationally and globally represent one of the top accreditation bodies for schools, schools and universities. So, so mm -hmm. it's not just, some, you know, yeah, whack, yeah. Uh, you know, ideal, uh, it's, it's, they already have re re reputation, they're credible, uh, ministries are taking on uh, this framework, schools have started to train for it, and I think there is a lot of hope, and, and, if, and if any teachers or admin out there feel disenchanted with the school level and macro level uh, you know, forces, uh, to definitely you know, throw this name with your uh, you know, admin or, or, or someone, because it is something that schools are picking up on, the ACE framework. Yeah, will do. Um, last week we had Dr. Seema Imam, and she had spoken to us about the Finland system. Mm -hmm. um, we found something very aligned to that um, because uh, the students get to have autonomy in um, terms of getting to delve into what they're interested in. Um, you know, they were able to, I think they have a, a break, 15 minute break every hour and they were able to just go outside and, um, you know, create something or for, uh, work on the, in the garden mm -hmm. or with their animals. So um, definitely yeah. sounds like we're headed towards that yeah. way, inshallah. And again, it's always important for me to hear these things with the ear of a teacher. And one of the challenges, you know, even if a teacher wanted to personalize content for a student or activities, they face their own pressures as well, with the degree yeah. to which their admin allows flexibility in the curriculum, and and you know, exactly. and, and rarely do the teachers uh, get the get that leeway to do so. Yeah. You're right. So the question becomes: How can you align this vision, not just on, on the classroom level, but also on a on a, on a leadership level? Uh, and I would encourage. I mean, considering, uh, I mean, just. The way that I was invited to this interview itself uh, by uh, looking for like-minded educators, and at the end yeah. of the day, we need to see each other as a, as an educational community and find a likewise educators with similar visions and create institutions where this vision can come to life, and not so much to pursue a, a building of, of of employment or you know to pursue an institution of employment, but but to find a community where these visions and 
can can come to life. And uh, historically, you know, as as Muslims, uh, numbers did play a role in, in in how you know we grew and we know how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Mecca and then in Medina. I mean, yes. uh, you know, political and social change is very much uh, integral to our to our tradition. Uh, yeah. and maybe we we'll just uh, need to reconnect. Uh, you know, not with the yelling on the streets, but more thinking strategically about how how we can come together and create uh, communities that can remove these barriers and allow these ideas to flourish. Inshallah, sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> um, just on a different note, in terms of back to leadership, um, say as a principal, well, uh, if you do come across deficit language across your, uh, within your staff, uh, sorry, with your staff members, how do you deal with that? What's your best That's approach? Great, great yeah. question. Uh, there's a school of thought in sociology called the functional uh, school of thought, where even social ills are seen to play a positive function in society. So without, uh, you know, crime, uh, we would not know right from wrong. Well, for uh, me, yeah. You're, you're an example of that. Um, you know, as you've mentioned, you were on the other side of the principal's table. So now, uh, desk, so now you know <laughs> what the students need. Yeah. So I do recognize that this type of talk uh, is useful to a certain degree. So depending yeah. on the context, I can hear it for what it means because it facilitates conversation. If I wanted to be really like a literalist, uh, I would just at, at at the sight of it or just hearing it, I'd stop and try. No, this is prejudice. This is not up to standards of uh, you know ethical teaching standards, and you know. But it does play. Instead of explaining what he or she wants to explain in thirty minutes, they were able to do so in one second, and I get the gist. Okay, but what I found is very helpful, and where I find my role is critical, is to engage with that issue in a in a to, to problematize the issue, and. Just through probing questions, not 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 with any sense of uh, of uh, you know, I'm not. What's the word? Start with the P. I'm not. I'm not patronizing. You know, my colleague, but uh, you know, all Emiratis are like that. Okay, in your class, are all Emiratis not not engaged? No, no, no. But this student is engaged. Oh, okay. They're Emirati, but they're engaged. Okay. So what is it about them? Well, I know that he's interested in soccer, and he like. So it's about. How do you take this, this label and through questions break it down into something productive? Inshallah, yeah. Something productive. And to also be very transparent in, in, in what can be done in the classroom level and what I can do on my level and what I can you know, report to people above us where they can also do, you know, do on that level. And, and that's where I feel you know, I'm contributing to my teachers now who are in classrooms by me, you know, having this conversation on, on a global level, you know, I feel that also I'm contributing to Mr. X, who's frustrated in this class because the Emiratis are not engaged. It's, it's continuing this conversation and being more, uh, Freire talks about, uh, he goes beyond cultural competency and he talks about uh, so, uh, critical consciousness, which is an awareness about the issues at hand. We can say, okay, they're like this because Emirati or the lights of the Lebanese, but what does that really represent? What are the dangers of, of believing that? And what are the benefits of believing that? And how can we build bridges and remove barriers? And, mm -hmm. and if I can just quickly point out, that's my ultimate kind of de facto question. As long as they're talking about Emiratiness or Lebaneseness or African Americanness as a barrier, then there's something there that we need to untie and undo and, and facilitate. We want to we want to take that Emiratiness, but make it as a as a bridge for us. We want to use the very uh, you know uh, kind of group of attributes or interests or behaviors or, or habits or attitudes and see how we can flip that over and turn that into a bridge, as I discussed with the punctuality uh, challenge. Yeah. Um, I'm not a leader, but it's something that I've been confronted with for many years and it's something that I don't know how to deal with. Um, 
obviously first gain some resiliency and don't take things too personal. Uh, and then, as you've mentioned, through questioning and, you know, flipping that and making it work and, you know, through support as well. Um, giving us so much advice and key takeaways. May Allah reward you for sparing your time to share Anna. with us. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And uh, is there any way you can share my email address or just if anyone wants yeah. to follow up so if, and share any ideas? Or... Please, yeah. So if you um, just email me even some resources that you'd like to share with the members, um, I can share with them your email address and um, I'll post them up uh, this week, inshallah. Okay, great. Great, great. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum to all. Alaikum salam. Take care. Bye bye.